Good morning, everybody. I feel so uh, just restful and filled from that beautiful music and those amazing Appalachian harmonies. My goodness. And to get to work this morning with this beautiful band and then in a few minutes with my amazing friend Ken Miedema, I couldn't be more happy. And then to be with all of you, and I want to begin sincerely by thanking you. Thanking you for being at the Goose. Thanking you for finding a new location. <laughs> thanking you for putting this time aside and putting the money aside and, uh, and, and coming and being part of these days together. Uh, as Dr. Barber said last night, as Jeff Clark said last night, uh, being together in times like these is important. Like, you're going to have fun, and you're going to meet fun people, and you're going to eat some really nice Indian food, and you're, gonna, uh, you're going to enjoy incredible music and speakers. But being together is important for our souls, especially in crazy, hot mess times like these. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what's right. Wouldn't it be amazing? If every time a politician lied, that instead of just getting filled with rage about yet another lie, something else rose up within us, which is a hunger and thirst for telling the truth. Wouldn't it be amazing if every time a politician sold out to the coal and oil industries and was ready to put future generations at risk because of our destabilizing climate. Wouldn't it be amazing if every time the, the money that controls so much of this world won, that we had something rise up and say, I'm hungry and thirsty for something of greater value than money. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing if Every time a billionaire used his money and his platform to aggrandize himself and his own interests, wouldn't it be amazing if in us arose a desire for something of greater wealth than any billionaire has, and that is solidarity and trust among people, so that we would desire a kind of trust that could, could just wash away the power of money? Because human souls being aligned in that soul force that Gandhi spoke of, wouldn't it be wonderful if every time evil and injustice and wickedness and as Dr. Barber reminded us, Reverend Barber reminded us last night, sin abounds, that a desire for something better were to abound all the more inside of us. That to me would be a pretty amazing thing. It would be a way of saying, let's booby trap evil with good. Listen, I'm angry. I'm weary. Sometimes I'm depressed because an awful lot of trouble is out there. But then I try to comfort myself with these words. It will probably get worse. The reason I comfort myself with those words is because then it helps me get in touch with an illusion I, I had. It's easy, especially for a, a white male like myself, to have this kind of illusion. But the illusion was that things used to be pretty good. And now they've taken this fall for the worse. And if they could just get back to where they were. But now, I, w when I comfort myself with those words that things could get worse, what I'm saying is, you know what? Things weren't so good before, and they may have to get worse before they get better. And so what I'm going to do as they get worse, instead of wishing for something in the past, I'm going to let a desire grow in me for something better. Does that ring true with you? To let a desire grow in me for something better. Some of you know, um, I had a, the big project I've been working on the last couple of years is called Do I Stay Christian? It just came out. Thank you. 
And when I wrote this book, I was not writing it as an apologetic, uh, telling you, you have to stay Christian or you're stupid or you have to stay Christian or you're going to hell or you have to stay Christian or wh whatever. I, I didn't want to do that because listen, let's be honest, the Christian religion has wounded and damaged so many people so deeply that like an abusive family, you can't tell them to stay under the same roof with abusers. It's, it's, so I, I didn't want to write a book that tried to argue people into doing something that everything inside of them says, this isn't working, I can't keep going on like this. What I wanted to do is try to write a book to help people name and identify and sit with the struggle of holding a conflicted religious identity. And as I wrote the book, I realized that although since I was literally probably 11 or 12 years old, I have frequently thought about disassociating myself from the Christian faith in which I was raised. Never once, this is honest truth, never once in the 66 years of my life, I know I don't look a day over 76, but in these 66 years of my life, I have never for a day thought, I'm really tired of Jesus and I'd just like to be done with him forever. Like, honestly, I've never thought, you know that thing about turn the other cheek? I kind of prefer Donald Trump's method. If somebody pu punches you, you punch him back 10 times as hard. Never once have I thought, I'd like to turn my back on Jesus and follow Donald Trump. Never. I've never, when I, when I hear that, love your neighbor as yourself. Never once have I thought, you know, I'd really rather just exploit my neighbor. I can't wait to find another neighbor to get into my multi-level marketing scheme and exploit. When Jesus said, love your enemy, I've never thought, you know what I really wish is I had a lot more weapons with a lot more bullets. Like, I do not understand anyone who just wants to kill all their enemies. I, I would never want to turn away from Jesus' teaching that dares to say, as someone eloquently said uh, recently, you can't gun your way out of a gun problem. You can't violence your way out of a violence problem. The only way out of these problems is to love. And I, in spite of all my frustrations with the Christian religion in almost all of its forms, I've never thought, that Jesus was just wrong or stupid or naive. When he tells the story of the Good Samaritan, I never think, boy, I really would like to be like the priest or Levite in that story. When he says to love God and hate money, I've never thought, actually, I prefer money to hell with God. I've never thought that for a second. And, and when I grapple with this. Part of what I try to do in this book is to just help people say, listen, it may be that do I stay Christian is the wrong question to preoccupy yourselves with. In the process of grappling with that question, I, I won't say the wrong question, but it's not the ultimate question. In the process of grappling with that question, maybe the deeper question is, what kind of human being do I really, really, really want to be? so that I can use my one and only life, one day less of it left every single day. Like a, a bar of soap, the more you use it, the less you have. So my little sliver of a bar of soap that's left, how do I want to use it? What kind of person do I want to be in this world? And so what I'd like to do this morning is just give you all permission I'd like to give you permission to, if you agree with me, and you don't have to agree with me, but to give you permission to say, I really think Jesus was smart. I know that's not in any of the creeds, but these days I'm coming to think that it's maybe the most important confession of faith that we need. I think Jesus was smart. Christianity 
can really be stupid sometimes in its various forms. I can really be stupid sometimes. And no offense, but But I think Jesus had a wisdom that we need so much in our lives and in our world today. And so all I'd like to do in these few minutes is I would just like to have us meditate this morning on that most seminal of Jesus' teachings found in the Gospel of Matthew in one version, in the Gospel of Luke in another version, a sermon on a mount in one version, a sermon on a plain in another version. I call it Jesus Mountainside Festival. Why would Jesus call for a mass gathering out in the country? We've been hearing a lot of hearings lately about a mass gathering in a capital city. Mass gatherings are a big deal. When people invite other people to a mass gathering, and by the way, nobody showed up in the, for the Sermon on the Mount without some organizing. When people showed up out in the country, it was because Jesus and his disciples had done some organizing and say, hey, on such and such a date, let's meet out on that hillside. Let's meet out in that countryside. When, when you amass people in a capital city and you tell them to bring weapons and you tell them to come and be angry and prepare to be wild, you're doing something very, very intentional. You have a goal, a strategy in mind. But when you invite people to gather out in the country, in the countryside, it's different. And so in his first mountainside festival, Jesus, in a sense, begins the mass mobilization of a movement. He's been doing the quiet one-on-one -on -one meetings that are so essential to any kind of organizing. He meets with a guy named Peter, his brother, Andrew, he meets with another guy named John and his brother James. He meet, has these small private meetings. He starts bringing people together. He does something over here in Nazareth. He does a little thing over here. It's movement leadership. It's movement building. And then he has this big mass gathering. And when he begins, he does not begin the way that many movement leaders begin. They begin by getting you angry at the people you're against. Because anger is one of the most powerful emotions and organizing features available to people. In fact, it really is the secret sauce of demagogues and authoritarians. Stir up people's anger and give them permission to fantasize about the expression of their anger. And then they'll, they'll follow you anywhere. Follow me, and I will let you vent your anger as you've never vented it before. It's a powerful movement strategy. Jesus does the opposite. If you want to say the opposite of venting your anger, what would it be? It's to bless. And in this passage that we call the Beatitudes, Jesus says, and it's the first words out of his mouth in this, in this gathering, Blessed are. Now, we usually think of this means these are the people I hereby pronounce that God blesses. I'd like to propose to you that's true, but I don't think it's what Jesus is saying. Jesus doesn't say God bless the poor. He said blessed are the poor. Now, I'm an old English teacher, and that's called a performative verb. It's a verb that makes something happen. The act of saying it is the purpose. You make something happen. Like if I say, thank you. The act of saying, thank you, thanks you. If I say, I now pronounce you husband and wife or whatever, I'm, the act of saying the words does the job. And so in a certain sense, when Jesus gathering a crowd said, 
says, blessed are, he's not just saying God blesses, maybe even more significant, he's saying, we now hereby bless. And who does he bless? We now hereby bless the poor, the vulnerable. In Matthew's version, he says the poor in spirit. In Luke's version, it just says the poor. I kind of like Luke's version because what I feel happens, preachers take poor in spirit and they remove it from the actual physical economic reality of poverty. They turn it all into a churchy thing. But what if in spirit, what if, what if we look at that phrase more closely? Um, I, I have a dear friend who's very, very ill right now. And I haven't been able to visit this friend. So what I say is I say, I'm so sorry I can't visit you. I'm with you in spirit. It means I'm in solidarity with you. I wish I could be with you, but I am with you in solidarity. I care with you. My heart is with you. So how about this? We now hereby, in this zone out in the countryside, where we're not being surveilled by CCTV ca cameras, and we're not, we don't have the Roman soldiers breathing down our necks, out here in the country, we've pulled away from everybody else. In this space, we now hereby bless the poor. Nobody else gives a rip about them. Nobody else is caring for them the way they need to be cared about. No, the, our leaders are forgetting them. So many, uh, our business leaders who are getting rich, they're exploiting them. You maybe heard the saying, in fact, I understand this was an old saying in Stalinist Russia about the Ukrainian farmers. The, the poor Ukrainian farmers, they said, were the shit in which they grew their money. So the poor, for many people, are the people whose labor we exploit to make our wealth. And so he says, here and now, we bless the poor, and we bless those in solidarity with the poor. Listen, the kind of movement that Jesus was building was not a movement that started by saying, let's hate the powerful and rich, but it starts by saying, let's bless, let's appreciate, let's value, let's feel in our hearts the dignity, and, and let's empathize with the pain and sorrow of the poor. And let's honor the poor and say they count. You understand, this was a, a huge part of the scandal of that phrase, Black Lives Matter. It was a way of saying, bless black lives in a culture that exploited black lives and ignored black lives and uh, as Reverend Barber said last night dared to have the Supreme Court say that those lives don't matter then here and now in this countryside place we bless those who mourn now the word mourn I think could be extended in various ways, but the actual word that Jesus uses refers to the bereaved. All of you who've lost a loved one, you know you're someone who mourns the loss of a loved one. And in Jesus' day, how did so many people die too young? Because they were too poor to have health care. They were too hungry to maintain their health and they were victims of violence and war, either because their king sent them out to fight or somebody else's king came and invaded their land. Victims of sickness and violence and apathy of their neighbors. And so Jesus says, around here, we look at all of those people who've lost loved ones because of these deep, injustices, these social sins, and he says, we feel their pain. We love them. We honor them. We bless them. They're people we care about. We're in this for them. Blessed are the poor and the bereaved. We bless those who are brave enough 
to be nonviolent activists. The meek are the nonviolent who are brave enough not just to fight violence with violence. We bless the nonviolent. You know, I, I grew up Protestant, and we didn't really make a big deal about saints, although we had our own informal saints. But I, I think it would be wise for us to get a list in our minds of great nonviolent leaders, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, Muslim, secular, whatever, but to know the people who have led with nonviolence and to say, blessed is John Lewis. Blessed is Dr. King. We bless them. We honor them. We revere them. Because you understand how the war, the military industrial complexes of this world, going back to Jesus' day with the Roman Empire and up to our day with the American and now the global oligarchic crime syndicate empire, that, that you, it, when you're in the military industrial complex, Blessed not are those who mourn, it's blessed are those who have kill power. For they shall inherit the earth. Not blessed are the meek, but blessed are the violent, for they shall gain power through their violence. Blessed are those who we bless, we here and now, in this countryside place, we link our hearts with those who are insatiably hungry and thirsty, as the beautiful song just said, for what is right, for what is just. We here and now bless not the vengeful, but the merciful. Those who are willing to look at people, even the people who are our opponents, even the people who we think are, are causing the greatest danger. And to say, my goal isn't to, to get revenge on you. My goal is that you could be stopped from the evil you're doing so that mercy could flow to you. That you could have a change of heart. I was with a Muslim leader uh, in, who who's, does beautiful work in Detroit some years ago, and we were on a little panel uh, together, a little group together, being asked questions. And someone asked the question, what difference does your faith make to your social activism work? And Imam Dawood had this pause. It was the pause that you often find among thoughtful people who aren't just working off talking points, but who seemed to be going into himself and consulting the deepest part of himself before he answered. And after the pause, he said, I suppose the biggest difference my faith makes to my social activism work is that I never consider that a person is beyond redemption. And that when I'm involved in Michigan politics that are ugly and in Detroit politics that are often so ugly, when I'm involved with systems that are heartless and rigged in favor of the people who exploit and against those who are exploited, when I'm in these tough situations, I try to look at my opponents and say, you too are not beyond redemption. We here and now bless those who are merciful rather than vengeful. We here and now bless all who choose to be pure in heart rather than deceitful. Listen, if you never really understood that word pure in heart, after the last several years watching how our political life works, on big lies, on people pretending to think things we know they don't really think, you understand? Blessed are those who are genuine, Blessed are those who are authentic. Blessed are those who are not giving false fronts. Blessed are those who are pure. The same thing at the bone as they are at the surface. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed, we here and now bless those who are spreaders of peace rather than spreaders of hate and fear and division. We bless not those who persecute, but we bless those 
who are persecuted for the sake of justice. Let's look at who's standing up for justice and let's bless them. And then he makes it personal and he says, and basically says, okay, are you prepared for this? If you have joined me in blessing these kinds of people, then you are the next to be persecuted because now you have aligned yourself with the prophetic tradition. Have you noticed how often prophets go out into the wilderness, go out into the country? It's in a, in a sense, they have to get away from the noise and the value system of the city. And when they go into the wild, they have this time in the wild where now they see a different logic, they hear a different pattern, they feel a different music. Some of us felt it even for a moment when we saw the photographs from the new Webb telescope over the last week, and we saw those galaxies spread out like diamonds cast on a, a piece of black velvet. And we just for a moment felt awe, and we thought there's a perspective that puts our lives in a new perspective. There's a different logic. And the prophets so often retreat into the wilderness for a period of time. They gain a new perspective and then they go back into society to do their work. Blessed. And he ends by saying, so interesting, so interesting for us right now. Because I think many of us have thought we were in a difficult time, not just in our country and our economy, but in our global civilization. And I think when we're honest with ourselves, we maybe need to give ourselves permission to admit it. We're not near the end of a difficult time. We're at the be beginning of birth pains, as Jesus said. And so we have to prepare ourselves and steel ourselves for a struggle that could be a lot longer than any of us thought or wished it would be. And if we decide that we cannot be happy again, we cannot rejoice and be glad again until things get better, I don't think we're going to make it. And so Jesus ends the Beatitudes by saying, rejoice and be glad, celebrate and be happy. One last thing. After the Beatitudes, Jesus then says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, as a movement leader, he's invited people out into the countryside. It's his movement recruited strategy. Get them away for a few hours or a whole day or a couple days away from the craziness of their normal lives when their notifications are chiming on their first century cell phones and where business and you know all the rest is going on. It, he, get them away for a few days, help them reorient. Start by helping them see who and what they're for. Start by helping them see who their hearts want to rise up and call blessed. But then help them understand when we form this movement, when we form this community of people, we're not doing it so that we get blessings and everybody else gets curses and damnation. You understand, if you know anything about the first century, there were a lot of extremist religious groups with all kinds of crazy end-of-the-world conspiracy theories. I know it's hard to imagine a world like this. And a lot of these religious leaders were super vicious. For example, the Essenes, among whom it appears that John the Baptist may have been associated for a period of time, at least they were working in the same neighborhood John the Baptist was. The Essenes, they pulled into these little communities and they talk about OCD. I mean, they had, they had seven baptisms a day very often. It became this obsession with, with we're purer than anybody else. And the idea is we come out in the country to be so pure, much purer than everybody else that we cannot wait but fantasize about how God will come and destroy all of those people in Jerusalem who are so corrupt. We've pulled away from the religious establishment. We are pure. We are way better than they are. Have you ever been tempted to think that way? So Jesus makes it clear, hey, listen, folks. We're not forming that kind of a movement here. We're learning how to be light 
so that we can bring light for the benefit of everyone. We're learning how to be salt so that we can bring flavor and preservation and maybe even fertilizer to everybody else. We're here not to the exclusion of everybody else. This movement is bringing people together for the benefit of everybody else. And so Jesus says, do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. Now, any of you who've read some of my writings know one of my great passions is the environment. And I, 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 think, I think climate change is such a real and urgent problem that every decision we make, it's, it's like the background to that decision. And I think racial in inequity and racism and white supremacy, I think they are, I don't think our civilization is worth saving unless it purges itself of the racism that has been so deeply embedded in it. So you just take those two problems. One will, will end civilization as we know it if we don't learn how to live more equitably with the earth. And one, is our civilization even worth saving if we don't learn how to live more, in, more equitably with one another? You put those together and you realize that we're in deep, deep trouble. And look, I think religion is part of the problem. And I think capitalism is part of the problem. And I think um, the American government and way of life are part of the problem, as are the Chinese way of life and the Indian way of life and the you know, whatever way of life. I think our human way of life is a problem. And I understand, believe me, I understand when people just say, F that, burn it all down. The desire to destroy what's destructive is very, very understandable. The desire to destroy what's not working is very, very understandable. And it's relatively easy to burn it all down. Look, we're hearing hearings in this country about a group of people who wanted to burn it all down. It's understandable and it's easy when you're motivated by that anger and hate. But Jesus says, do not think that I have come to burn it all down. I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, the two great chapters of our past. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What does fulfill mean? The law took us so far, and then we needed the prophets. The prophets took us so far, and now I'm here. You could say it this way. Law takes us a certain distance. The work of compassion and justice takes us a really necessary distance. But ultimately, we need a universal and non-discriminatory love. I didn't come to abolish those things. I didn't come to burn them down. I just think they're the floor upon which we build the next story. And so he says, I've come to fulfill them, to bring the fruition that they cannot bring of themselves unless we're willing to take the next step. And so the sermon continues. And if I could offer a little free suggestion, if you wanted to do something that could enrich your life between now and the next wild goose, it might be just go on your computer and take Matthew 5 through 7, download it, print it out, and stick it on your desk. Or if you have an old-fashioned one of these, stick a bookmark. And every time, leave it out somewhere obvious. And every time you pick it up, just, just between now and then, just saturate yourself in this wisdom of this movement leader named Jesus 
Look, all the other things we might want to say about Jesus are fine, but I think if we don't start with this, Jesus was smart. He knew what he was talking about. And if you pay attention and he earns your trust, you'll want to be a certain kind of person. What I'd like to invite us to do now, we're going to have uh, the folk song come back. Uh, and um, I'm just going to invite us to have a few moments in silence as we start this day. They're going to sing for us. The, the music will stop. We'll just have two or three minutes of silence together. And all I'd like to invite you to do in that silence is nothing. Just let the silence descend. If there's a simple truth that becomes clear to you, beautiful. If there's a simple emotion that arises to the surface, beautiful. But all I'd like to invite you to do is enjoy this period of silence springing from this beautiful psalm that invites us to pull away from all the noise, to come out into the countryside and to uh, hear and feel the logic and beauty that resides in God's world.
just like a wind babe in mama's arms. So is my soul within thee. Thank you so much. So this day, the uh, Wild Goose Festival, our first full day together, we've pulled away, we're out in the countryside. The movement that has been being born again and again, generation after generation, that movement is still alive, it's still spreading. Last night, Reverend Barber and Jay Quest and others just poured a bunch of kindling and logs on the fire and that fire will continue to build in this week ahead. So I just want to thank you again for being here, for coming out here away from the normal rush and noise of life. Let's let whatever happens in our heart, don't get distracted, don't don't let yourself fall into all the different traps that can happen. Just see this as an opportunity for our hearts to get tuned, to be part of that vital movement that's needed so much in our world today. Amen. <laughs>